Thank you, Barbara. Hi, everybody. My name is Aubrey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. We're deep into There is a Solution, Chapter 2 of the Big Book. And there's so much packed into the rest of this chapter. This chapter started out being kind of a split of two chapters. It, it, the first part of this chapter, which we'll finish tonight, leads us into more about alcoholism. And then the second part of this chapter leads us into we agnostics. And this is part of a little package they sent out to, to spread the news of the book along with Bill's story. And they spread the news of the book out to everyone and uh, tried to get a little funding. They tried to put a little bit more into just those, that little booklet than to have the other two full chapters in it. So we're starting on page 22. Last week, we read that longest paragraph in the big book. It starts on 21 and ends on 22. It's a full page. And it's a description of the alcoholic and all the ramifications of an alcoholic. And it's very intense. But it goes on to say that this is by no means a comprehensive picture of the alcoholic. But this description would identify him roughly. And I believe everybody last week could definitely relate to at least some part of what the description of an alcoholic was all about. Hiding bottles around the house, getting disgustingly and dangerously antisocial when we drink, drinking at the wrong times. It was pretty clear that most of us had some part of that description of alcoholism in our systems. So the real dilemma, though, was why was an alcoholic the way he is? Why did he get disgustingly and antisocially drunk all the time? Why did he get that drunk? I mean, he had to pick up a drink. Why was that? So it says, why does he behave like this? This is on page 22, the second full paragraph. Why does he be behave like this? If hundreds of experiences have shown him that one drink means another debacle with all its attendant suffering and humiliation, why is it that he takes that one drink? Why can't he stay on the water wagon? What has become of his common sense and willpower that he still sometimes displays with respect to other matters? I know I asked myself that a million times. Why did I pick up that drink? I said that a million times in the midst of a horrible hangover. Why did I get drunk? But I got drunk. Goes on to say, perhaps there never will be a full answer to these questions. Opinions vary considerably as to why the alcoholic reacts differently from normal people. We are not sure why. Once a certain point is reached, little can be done for him. We cannot answer the riddle. So why does the alcoholic react differently from normal people insinuates that an alcoholic is not a normal person. And that's true. We are not normal. It goes on to say, we know that while the alcoholic keeps away from drink, as he does for months or years, he reacts much like other men. We are equally positive that once he takes any alcohol, whatever, into his system, something happens, both in the bodily and mental sense, which makes it virtually impossible for him to stop. The experience of any alcoholic will abundantly confirm this. And I can confirm that. Something happens when we have that first drink. We just, we don't behave right. We can't stop drinking. We have more and more and more. We don't know why we started drinking, but we started drinking. And we know it's bad for us, and we still do it. So <clears throat> here comes the big understanding we have to have. On page 23, the first full paragraph, these observations would be academic and pointless if our friend never took the first drink, thereby setting the terrible cycle in motion. And therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind 
rather than in his body. I will repeat that. Mark it in your books. Try to remember this. Therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. It's our mind that causes us to pick up the first drink. And then once we do that, now that alcohol is in our body and we have absolutely no control after that. The allergy gives us a craving for another and another and another and another. And we can't stop once we've had one. The good deal would be to not have that first one. But we can't stop. We're, there's something in our mind, that obsession, that makes us want that first drink. And we'll learn more about that in just a minute. So if you ask him why he started on the last bender, the chances are he will offer you any one of a 100 alibis. Sometimes these excuses have a certain plausibility, but none of them really make sense in the light of the havoc an alcoholic's drinking bout creates. They sound like the philosophy of the man who, having a headache, beats himself on the head with a hammer so he can't feel the ache. If you draw this fallacious reasoning to the attention of an alcoholic, he will lap it off or become irritated and refuse to talk. So the alcoholic doesn't understand why he took that drink. He doesn't understand. It's hard for an alcoholic to think about just before he had the drink. We always, as when I was drinking, I always thought about it after the fact. I was drunk when I said, why the hell did I get drunk? I was already drunk. Once I've had that first drink, there's no going back. Thousands of times I proved that and had more and more drinks. But if right before I had that first drink, if I could have thought about it and not picked up that first drink, I wouldn't be drunk. And that's why this is a matter of the mind, not the body. Once the alcohol is in the body, the body craves it so bad we can't resist it. And that's a physical part of it. But before we have that first drink, we're not craving alcohol. We just have an obsession of the mind. The obsession exists in the mind. The allergy exists in the body. Once the allergy is kicked off, we can't stop drinking, but that's in the body. But we have a chance before we pick up that first drink, if, our, if we can think about it right. And we'll read more about why we can't. Okay. Once in a while, he may tell the truth. And the truth, strange to say, is usually that he has no idea why he took that first drink than you have. Some drinkers have excuses with which they are satisfied part of the time, but in their hearts, they really do not know why they do it. Once this malady has a real hold, they are a baffled lot. There is the obsession that somehow, someday, they will beat the game, but they often suspect they are down for the count. Now, Bill is an exceptional writer. Bill re-emphasizes things with the same words. Sometimes he uses the same words over and over again to, to hit the point. Other times, he says similar words to get the point, but he re-emphasizes over and over and over again important things. So here, that sentence... There is the obsession that somehow, someday, they will beat the game, but often they suspect they are down for the count. Well, if we just simply move over from page 23 to page 30, we will read this sentence in the first paragraph. It says, the idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. And that's in our next chapter. But it's saying the same thing in this chapter, that the obsession that somehow, someday, he, he will beat the game, be able to drink like other people. Well, other people, other normal people, 
the drinker is abnormal. The alcoholic is an abnormal drinker. And we want to drink like other people who are not abnormal. They're normal. They may drink, they may be heavy drinkers, but they're not alcoholics. There's a big difference. The alcoholic cannot control his drinking, nor his behavior after he has the first drink. They often suspect they are down for the count. How true this is, you realize. In a vague way, their families and friends sense that these drinkers are abnormal. Again, he's telling us drinkers are abnormal. But everybody hopefully awaits the day when the sufferer will rouse himself from his lethargy and assert his power of will. But we just read before that his willpower goes away. His willpower isn't strong enough to keep him from having that first drink. The tragic truth is that if the man be a real alcoholic, the happy day may not arrive. He has lost control. At a certain point in the drinking of every alcoholic, he passes into a state where the most powerful desire to stop drinking is of absolutely no avail. This tragic situation already arrived in practically every case long before it is suspected. That's another insidious part of alcoholism. You may start out drinking early on and just be a social drinker. And then your social drinking gets a little more frequent and a little longer at times, and you get a little drunker, but you're still social drinking. And then you may become a heavy drinker. And a social drinker and a heavy drinker can quit if a good enough reason presents itself for them to quit. What happens then is they go further and the heavy drinker turns into an alcoholic and he crosses that line, lets alcohol be his master, as Bill put it in Bill's story, without realizing it. And once he realizes it, the biggest deal that he realizes is that, oops, I've crossed the line and it's not good. You get into that position where now you really can't quit drinking, period. And you know it and you're defeated and alcohol is running your life. So the next paragraph is in italics. Italic means that it is very important. This is something we should all keep in mind, especially newcomers in your first 30 days, six months, year. Keep this in mind. The fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without defense against the first drink. If you have no defense against the first drink, that means that just about every opportunity to have a drink whether it just comes to you or you go out and get in the wrong place, you don't have a defense, so you'll take that drink. And you'll take that drink, and then you'll take another, and you'll take another. So the advice is to get a defense against the first drink. And somehow or another, we don't really take that seriously sometimes. I didn't in the beginning. I didn't take it serious. I didn't think it meant make a plan. I didn't think there was any action to be taken to have a defense against the first drink, I just thought, oh, well, that's no problem. I just won't go to a bar. That's my defense against the first drink. I just won't go to a bar. Well, that doesn't always work. You know, go out to dinner. Some places when you go to dinner might not be a bar, but they serve booze. 
So if you don't have a defense against the first drink and you're going out to eat, there you are in a place that serves booze. If somebody says, hey, let's get a round of beers, you're liable to let it happen. You don't have a defense against it. You can't think strong enough to make not having a drink important at that time. Sometimes we go to parties when we're new. We go to a party with people outside of AA. You know, it's a school party, so I'll just go to the school party. I'm not going to drink. Don't worry about it. Well, then you get there, and people are always forcing you, trying to get you to drink. Ah, come on, have one. You just go, no, I quit. I quit drinking. Ah, come on, one won't hurt you. When we get ourselves in a position where people are getting on us about not having, you know, not drinking with them, one won't hurt you. That's what everybody who's not an alcoholic or everybody who's an alcoholic thinks is that one drink won't hurt you. And we know that's not true, but we'll drink anyway. And we do it. We find ourselves in positions where it's not expected to drink. We're not expected to drink, but takes one second, one single second to make the wrong decision. You know, we'll read in more about alcoholism, several guys, guy that went to a diner, he's sitting in a diner, and he goes, a drink with, in milk won't hurt me. He was drinking milk. So he says, a shot of whiskey and milk is not going to hurt me. He just had that thought. He had been perfectly okay all day long, perfectly sane and everything he did. And then he said, a shot of whiskey in my milk won't hurt me. One insane thought that took two seconds. And he was off and running again. You know, another guy went out to dinner. And after dinner, he said, I'll just go have a highball after dinner. You know, he thought that was okay. And he didn't show up at home for days. He was done. He was on a run. You know, it only takes one. You only have to be insane for about a second. You're not insane the rest of the day. One second, you make that insane thought that a, a shot of whiskey won't hurt you and you're drunk again. In our getting sober and staying sober, since we haven't done all our steps and we haven't read the whole big book and we haven't gone to that many meetings, we should definitely work on getting a defense against the first drink. Don't be in a place where you can drink. And if you go to one of those parties, maybe it's a family affair or a school affair or something, you go to something that's very innocent affair. And you say, I'm not going to drink, but be ready to, if you're being forced to drink, if you're being encouraged to drink, walk out the door, get in your car and go home. It takes a plan like that to stay sober in the beginning. So actually make a real plan. Never go to such a thing without going with someone in the program. Invite one of your AA friends with you to the party and hang with them. And if, if it starts getting rough, you got some help there. You have someone who will help you stay sober, whose goal is to keep you sober that night. So have a real plan, not just the idea, oh, I'll get a defense against the first drink. Too many people have died because of that idea because they didn't think it was necessary to get a defense against the first drink. You know, if you have a couple of drinks, you may not come back. You know, it's happened way too many times. So get a defense against the first drink. It goes on to tell us even more why we should. It says, the almost certain consequences that follow taking even a glass of beer do not crowd into the mind to deter us. We don't think about the last time we drank. If these thoughts occur, they are hazy and readily supplanted with the old threadbare idea that this time we shall handle ourselves like other people. We can't handle ourselves like other people, like those normal people, because we're abnormal, remember? The alcoholic is abnormal. So if we're trying to think we're going to be like those other people who are normal, we're on the wrong team. 
You know, we need to get with people who are abnormal because the abnormal people will help us get out of that situation. So take somebody from AA with you. There is a complete failure of the kind of defense that keeps one from putting his hand on a hot stove. I remember when I was a little kid, shorter than a range, a kitchen range, and there was that handle sticking out from that cast iron pot my mom was using. And I reached up and grabbed it. Well, I had no more skin on my hand after that. It took the skin right off. I was blistered and it hurt bad. And boy, that took forever to get well. My hand was sore for a couple of weeks. But you know something? I never had the obsession ever again to reach up and grab a hot pan handle. It never occurred to me that that would be a good idea. No one had to coax me into, you know, I never did it again. I remember how bad that hurt, but I don't remember how bad the last drunk hurt me. It could be a week later and I wouldn't know. I wouldn't remember it. I would still take that drink, but I'll never reach out and touch one of them hot pots again. That's for sure. The alcoholic may say to himself in the most casual way, it won't burn me this time, and here's how. Or perhaps he doesn't think at all. How often have some of us begun to drink in this nonchalant way, and after the third or fourth, pounded on the bar and said, for God's sakes, how did I ever get started again? Only to have that thought supplanted by, well, I'll stop at the sixth drink. Or what's the use anyhow? And that's what it is. That one second of an insane thought gets us having that first drink. And we have to always keep that in mind all the time. So really keep that in mind. When this sort of thinking is fully established in an individual with alcoholic tendencies, he has probably placed himself beyond human aid. And unless locked up, he may die or go permanently insane. Beyond human aid the first mention of something bigger than us. We've gotten ourselves into a position where all our willpower, all our knowledge, self-knowledge, everything we know, everything we try can't help us. And it's going to take something bigger than us. And here's the first time that Bill mentions in this chapter that we've placed ourselves in a position beyond human aid. He says, these stark and ugly facts have been confirmed by legions of alcoholics throughout history. But for the grace of God, would there have been thousands more convincing demonstrations? So many want to stop, but cannot. Bill mentions God, the grace of God. So the grace of God has something to do with reducing the numbers of people that demonstrate alcoholism. The grace of God is, is part of it, something bigger than us, beyond human aid. Okay, so that doesn't mean your sponsor, your sponsor is a human. It doesn't mean anybody else on earth. It means human aid, above human aid. It's got to be something different than human aid that eliminates all the people in the country and in the world because it's got to be something beyond human aid. So many want to stop, but cannot. There is a solution. So now we move into the second part of this chapter. First part, we've just learned everything we can learn about alcoholism for the time being. How horrible it is to be a full-blown alcoholic. What goes on in our minds. That it's the mind that causes the problem, not the body. You see, we keep thinking alcohol is the problem. But it's not. It's our thinking about alcoholism that's the problem. Because 
I've never walked down the street and passed in front of a bar and had a beer run out of the bar, knock me on the ground, and pour itself down my throat. I've never been the victim of an inanimate beer. In order for me to drink a beer, I have to, instead of walking by the bar, turn into the bar, walk inside, pick a seat, sit down, call the bartender over, take out my wallet, throw some money on the bar, and order the beer and wait for him to bring it to me and then pick it up and then pour it down my throat. So I have multiple actions to take to take place before I drink that beer, but I do it anyway. I do all those actions. And I have to think about the drink before I actually drink it. Every time. It's the mind that makes us have the first drink. It's not the alcohol. But once we have that first drink, then it is the alcohol because we get such an obsession for it, such a craving for that alcohol that we can't resist more. Before that first drink, it's our mind. It's the way we think. That's why it's so important in the third step to turn our will and our life over to the care of God. What's our will in our lives? Our will is our thinking, our lives are our actions. So my thinking sent me to the bar to drink that beer. And then I drank it and then the beer took over and made me want another and another and another. So it was my mind that got me in that bar. So the problem is in fact in the mind not the body. All right, there's a solution. Almost none of us like the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confession of our shortcomings, which the process requires for its successful consummation. But we saw that it really worked in others, and we had to come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as we had been living it. Okay, so the life that we were living was futile and hopeless. Mine was, that's for sure. But the process of getting sober and beating alcohol requires a process. It requires a lot of us to do things. It doesn't say it's suggested that we do things. It says it requires so what do we have to do? We have to uh, do self-searching. Where do we do self-searching? Step three, step four. Step four is an inventory. So we do self-searching there. Leveling of our pride. That's in step three, for sure. We downsize our ego. We get our ego to right size. We stop thinking of ourselves. We, we work with selfishness, disillusionment, uh, fear. And all in lowering ourselves, our egos. Confessing of our sins, our shortcomings. Well, that's the fifth step. So all this is this is part of the process. We got to go through that process. We have to do the steps. And it's for its successful consummation. And consummation means the end, finalizing an idea, ending an idea, getting it done for the process successful consummation. But we saw that it worked in others. You look around this room, you see this program working in others. You see people who have done their fourth step, their fifth step, their third step, all their steps. And they're sitting here sober and have been sober one day at a time for years and years and years. So they're proof that it works. And we look at them and decide that we can, it can work in us too if we follow these suggestions, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. So it says, when, therefore, we were approached by those in whom the problem had been solved, there was nothing left for us but to pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. 
We have found much of heaven and we have been rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence of which we had not even dreamed. You have to pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools. Someone gave us a kit of spiritual tools that will help us get sober. And how do we know that? Who was that? Who was it that gave us those tools? Well, again, Bill's miraculous, beautiful, inspired writing tells us on page 95 in the book, back in the chapter about working with others, it says, never talk down to an alcoholic for any moral or spiritual hilltop. Simply lay out the kit of spiritual tools for his inspection. Show him how they work with you. Offer him friendship and fellowship. Tell him if he wants to get well, you will do anything to help. So who does it? Your sponsor or another member of Alcoholics Anonymous. They hand you the 12 steps and help you work them. Help you make those tools work in your life so you can get sober. We start off. Here in there is a solution with the first step in our solution is to pick up this kit of spiritual tools given us for free, laid at our feet. They're right there. All we have to do is do them. And we were given them by somebody who's already done them. So that sets up for the future because in the future, we're going to take those same 12 tools we were given in the beginning and give them to somebody else. And that is a symbol of our moral psychology, when at this point we're taking what's being given to us, and later we give away everything we've got and give it back to someone else who needs it. So this is the beginning to show how this program works. And it's a miraculous way that Bill put the book together. And then after that, it talks about that fourth dimension. Well, we know what a dimension is. We know that wood, a two by four, two inches thick, four inches wide, and however long it is. So if it's two foot, it's two inches thick, four inches wide, two feet long. There's your three dimensions. What's the fourth dimension? Well, we're starting to talk about spiritual ideas, spiritual things, a power greater than ourselves. What is that? That's spirituality. So that realm of the fourth dimension is our spirituality as we develop that with our belief and understanding of a power greater than ourselves, how we get that, that power into our lives, how we trust and depend on that power, and that gives us our spirituality. And from that place of spirituality, we can see ourselves better. We can see the big picture. We can see from that vantage point of that fourth dimension, we can see that maybe we're being selfish, or maybe we're being inconsiderate, or maybe we're being greedy, or maybe we're being hateful, or whatever. And we can see it better from a place of spirituality. And we can see that it's our fault, not somebody else's. We can see what we have to do to fix ourselves. So getting into that fourth dimension, and he's talking about rocketed into it not stumbled upon, not sauntered into, but rocketed into this dimension. And we're going to learn a lot more about that next week. But we're going to read one more paragraph. The great fact is just this and nothing less. We have had deep and effectual spiritual experiences which have revolutionized our whole attitude towards life toward our fellows, and toward God's universe. The central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way that is indeed miraculous. He has commenced to accomplish those things for us which we could never do for ourselves. And what are we talking about? What is the thing that we're talking about that we could never do for ourselves? Not take the first drink. And God can do that for us. He has entered our hearts and our lives 
and is doing things that we couldn't do for ourselves. I couldn't quit drinking until I reached that fourth dimension and accepted a power greater than myself and it had a spiritual awakening, which took away the obsession to drink forever. This is a big deal. This is where our solution comes from. And we're going to learn next week a lot of other stuff about how this all came together. The idea that we have this book and 12 steps and can recover with a program of action laid out in this book is an absolute miracle because of some of the things that I'll explain next week. So please come back next week and hear a little bit more of this. We'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Back to you, Barbara.